Thank you so much to Daniel Berry and to all of our panelists in the last session. There were so many great things to take away from that for all of us. We are moving into the final session of this year's Sustainable House Day. Um, for our final session of the day, we're really glad to present a panel on retrofitting and building for bushfire resilience, hosted by architect Nigel Bell. Nigel is one of the many participants in our Green Rebuild Toolkit project which provides resources and expert advice to people impacted by bushfire. That project will be continuing in 2022. And you can find out more about it and see all of our online resources at greenrebuildtoolkit.com. We'll be putting that in the chat as well. So I'd like to introduce Nigel. Thank you very much, Rob. Very pleased to be here and the opportunity to be able to talk to whatever number of people because sustainability at this time, just before the uh, coalition of partners is happening in uh, what, months and a half, five or six weeks. And the fact that our homes that we build now or retrofit hopefully will be around for many, many years. And certainly apart from sustainability, I'm sure those of you listening will agree that our new, newish challenge is how to deal with it in extreme climate change and particular bushfire. I come to you from Darug and Gundungurra land, Blue Mountains outside of Sydney, New South Wales. In brief, my background has been working as an architect in this area for decades. And in terms of bushfire, not only have my projects, one or two have burned down, <laughs> luckily most haven't, um, from the most recent bushfires, but I've been in working in this space for around 20 years. I represent the Institute of Architects on the three Australian standards, which are to do with bushfire safety, which is to do with bushfire refuges, to do with uh, water spray systems, sprinklers in common parlance, and more particularly the main one, Australian standard 3959, which is called construction of buildings in bushfire prone areas. I was uh, expert evidence to the Royal Commission last year, and so, yep, I've got the practical knowledge and the background knowledge to hopefully MC this session where we have several very interesting speakers with their own background story and their own knowledge and understanding of this important area. So I'd like to point out we have unfortunately two, not the additional people that had originally been discussed, but we have John Brennan, who is going to be able to talk about his Henry House in Victoria. And I hope you've all had the chance to have a look online to see what the lovely qualities are about how do you deal with Western sun? How do you build on top of a slope? What kind of materials are sustainable and bushfire resistant? And what about screens that slide across? How acceptable are they? They're the kind of questions that hopefully will tease out the response of that project and ask for uh, Paul to have a comment. Maybe some of you might want to add your own insights by way of commentary or questions as we proceed on. So that will be very interesting with John Brennan. Following that, we have Paul Cooper. Paul, I've known for years because he works in University of Wollongong and the headline project is called the Illawarra Flame House. But that is what has been on the website. That is a really interesting project of a decade or so ago about how to retrofit a 1950s style house to make it more sustainable. And that's a really good example. However, I do point out that that's, if you like, a suburban urban example. And it's actually more important to talk about what you see in the screen in front of you, which is Paul's own home, which was surrounded by bushfire in the early last year, early 2020 in the Southern Highland area. And he had his own personal experience um, of having to deal with it to prepare when the fire came through and then the aftermath. So Paul not only has technical knowledge and a very, very good understanding of the broader issues, he's got that personal experience of the fire coming right through and his house was saved. So we're lucky to have these two speakers and a couple of interesting projects and the opportunity to talk for most of the next hour. And let's get started. So 
In terms of questions, um, perhaps we should start with John Brennan. Are you there, John? I am indeed. Excellent. Thank you. So, John, um, you built about 10 or 11 years ago in Victoria, and it was the top of a hill. I gather it was a fairly small constricted site, so you had to place your house where you did. Is that correct? Not quite, but, but um, there were constraints. Um, we are on top of a hill, about 300 metres, 310 metres. Um, it's typical country uh, on the northeast uh, fringes of Melbourne, so very steep little hills and things. I think the, um, the driveway up to our house is uh, mostly one and five. I think there's a short stretch that's one and four. So very good for my exercise, up and down and up and down. Um, the, we've got a, um, a pair of ranges which run um, sort of uh, diagonally. Uh, so what's that uh, northeast, southwest, um, perhaps a kilometre and a half from us. What happened in the Kilmore bushfires is that the, um, the fire came roaring over the hill, went right through our property, um, down to, in fact, to our southern boundary, where the wind changed uh, on Wild Dog Creek, and uh, it, it blew back again. So what it didn't get the first time, it got the second time, more or less. So we had to rebuild completely. Um, the site that, that we got um, uh, and, and stayed with, it was a bit of a near call, but it had the building platform. It had a large, very large concrete water tank, which was not damaged. Uh, it had a shed, which miraculously survived. It had the phone connection, the electricity connection, and um, uh, fantastic views. So we decided to stick with it, Nigel. Um, there was a penalty to pay. Um, we tried monitoring it for uh, 10 days or so by living in a, in a camper van on the site to see what it was like. And uh, we, we were able to confirm it was windy. Um, and of course, the problem with enjoying our northern and western views is that that's not really where you want to have a solar exposure. So we had to take special measures, as you said in your introduction. Uh, uh, yes. would, you like me to talk, would you like me to talk a little bit about that? Yes, please do. Mm, okay, so the first step was, of course, um, we settled for a, a slab. Uh, it's on Waffle, so um, it's pretty well insulated. Uh, and we'd be very happy with the thermal performance of it. It's a marvellous heat sink. Um, Can I just get explain to people a Waffle slab? Would you like to explain or shall I? You explain, you're the architect. Okay, it's where you build off the, the ground by putting in the precast, it can either be plastic, which has water in it, or more typically EPS, expanded polystyrene blocks. So basically it's a grid of concrete to lift you up off the ground and you've got a lot of insulation underneath. So it's a particular kind of construction that people tend to use if they're in um, a perhaps a clay-based soil or something where uh, the additional height and rigidity of the slab becomes important. Mm. So, Both of which oh. applies, we're on clay. Um, it's uh, clay plus degraded Yarra mudstone. And um, I, I should have said that the, we're a semi-rural property. We're on uh, eight hectares with more leased land around us. Um, second thing, therefore, was that we, we considered uh, going for uh, steel cladding, rather like the image you saw a few moments ago. Uh, we were, I think there was less skillful use of it around, or less attractive models to look at. Anyway, we, we rejected that, it looked a bit industrial at the time. And um, we'd seen that rammed earth, our next door neighbor, his house effectively exploded. Um, that is to say that the rammed earth sort of disintegrated um, in the fire, such was its intensity. And um, we couldn't afford uh, things, other alternatives that people might like to think about, like Mount Gambia stone and so on, which look lovely, but we couldn't afford. So we, we went for a, a special proprietary cladding. It's timber, but it's impregnated with a fire retardant and uh, guaranteed to char, not burn. Uh, we haven't put it to the test yet. Uh, we also chose to stick for thermal reasons with timber um, frames for our windows and doors, which of course are double glazed. 
um, everything's double blazed. Uh, and again, it's specified to be one of those timbers that is prone to char rather than burn with a quickly passing fire. And, and perhaps that's useful to say as well, our experience on a hilltop was that the fire approached extremely quickly, but it also passed very, very quickly. So there was this intense front uh, because we'd taken quite a lot of care um, where our predecessors had taken quite a lot of care to keep any heavy vegetation, uh, in particular timber, well away from the house, not only on the northern side, but, but on all sides. So that uh, by the time it reached us, effectively it was a grass fire, um, plus all the stuff that was blowing through the air. Um, so we, we did that, the, the glazing, the external pane of the two is, um, is a tempered or, or some such. Toughened, like a, toughened glass. Yeah, toughened glass. Um, but we had to consider how to, to um, oh yes, and I should talk about the roof next. A couple of local houses were lost because the winds were such as to lift the junction of sheets of tin and embers got in, fire in the, in the roof cavity, goodbye house. Very, very hard to fight. Um, so we elected to have a continuous run, uh, which was an interesting prospect to get it up the hill, but we did. Um, so there are no joint, I mean, it's a, those U-shaped uh, profiles which lock together, but there is no join. And in fact, the, the, um, uh, the whole roof, which is a butterfly roof, drains to just one um, storm, a gutter, gutter. Um, and makes it much easier to keep clean. Um, so that was the roof. Then where the roof joined the walls, we've got a, um, a little um, profiled steel sheet so that it matches tight up against the, the roofing and embers can't get in there. Um, so the next thing to think about was the vulnerability of all that glazing um, and we, uh, elected to have two solutions. One is that on the western side and the northern, uh, some of the northern, oh, actually the eastern, western and eastern, we have um, sliding panels, steel panels, which are, are galvanized and are laser um, drilled, if you like, a bit like the sort of stuff that you see on trams and buses for advertising, where you can see the advertising from the outside, but the people inside can look out. Well, we've got that without the advertising. And um, uh, it's rated to exclude about 50% of the, I'm sorry, 80% of the heat. I'm not sure that it's quite as good as that, but anyway, but also of course it will exclude ember. So it's a very strong protection. Where we didn't have that, we've got some steel panels which we can quickly put in if it's a bad fire day and they just cover the entire window it feels a bit like fort knox when you do that but and we're actually going to replace those because with them um, with with um what's the word expanded metal uh, extended steel rather than solid sheeting because they're too damn heavy uh, and, and we also think there's a danger that the very high winds in time of fire will get behind and be sufficient to just rupture the fastenings where they fasten against windows and doors. Um, okay, that's probably enough on the structure, I think, Nigel. Yep, that's a great start. Thank you. It really helps us understand your approach and the thoroughness of it. And we'll come back to particular questions shortly. But let's move on to Paul Cooper to talk about your home, your experience, fire surrounding, and the aftermath. Paul, over to you, please. Thank you, Nigel, and uh, hello, everybody. Well, the house that you saw on the screen just uh, recently, my partner and I, with a builder designed uh, 24 years ago, so that's 1997. And it is located on a, a relatively steep block of land adjacent to the Morton National Park. And I should uh, also at this point acknowledge that uh, we're on Darawal country here and I'd like to acknowledge the uh, elders um, past, present and emerging. And 
this, so in 1997, clearly this was before bushfire resilience was part of the National Construction Code. And we went ahead and designed our house, which is timber framed house with glass fiber insulation, color bond corrugated sheet steel cladding. Nearly all the floors are uh, suspended on steel posts and bearers, the exception being our living area, which is a slab on fill, which is uh, giving us um, some good thermal mass. And uh, of course, you'd expect somebody who's from the Sustainable Buildings Research Centre at the University of Wollongong to uh, put some passive solar design into all this. So we uh, did our designs around good solar access in winter and, and uh, shading during the summer and so on. But it was, you know, uh, nearly 24 years ago. So we were using single glazed aluminium frame windows, nothing special there. And we had, we still have two uh, 22,000 litre water tanks and uh, I had a tank 40 metres in elevation above that, uh, which came to be important uh, when we had our fire uh, experience recently. And and also a, a modest dam very close to the house. And interestingly, when we built the house, we had our first bushfire experience then in 1997. A bushfire actually came through um, our property and while the builders were still on site finishing things off. So that completely demystified uh, for us the idea of living with bushfire. And now 24 years on, um, we were hit by the Karawan fire. And that was an entirely different matter. Uh, that was, um, as most of you will know, was a very, very serious fire. Our house survived, as Nigel mentioned, but many others in my area uh, were lost. And I, uh, there are many people still recovering from the impact of that fire. But one of the reasons why our house survived was because of the range of retrofits that I started undertaking almost as soon as the house was first built. And some of those retrofits included adding spr sprinklers around the house and also on the decks, and then uh, started to address things like our glazing systems, which weren't fire rated at all. So I self-built myself um, color bond shutters that I could put up uh, over the hang, in fact, in front of uh, our big windows around our lounge area and set about ember proofing the whole house using stainless steel mesh to replace fly screens, make the garage uh, ember proof and so on. Uh, and and um, so over the course of the 20 years and very intensively for the few weeks while the Karawan fire was making its way towards our part of the world, um, we installed a wide range of um, retrofits that I'd be happy to talk about. Um, and perhaps I'll just finish this introduction, Nigel, by saying that I'd like to put out a huge thank you, as I'm sure we all do, to all the volunteers and members of the emergency services and other organizations that supported the communities impacted by the Black Summer fires in 2019-2020. Absolutely, and thank you for that, Paul, because obviously the so-called Black Summer fires of 1990-1920 were unprecedented in their scale and their intensity right across the eastern seaboard of Australia, plus parts of West, sorry, South Australia, particularly Kangaroo Island, and then small parts of the uh, inland area of Western Australia. What people may not perhaps realise is inland Australia, up to 10% of Australia's land mass may burn in any given year. That's historically been the record, but it's mostly been in sparsely inhabited regions. What we saw a year and a half, two years ago, was obviously the most intense, widespread and unstoppable fire that is in recorded history, certainly the last few hundred years. And unfortunately, 
those of us who believe in all the climate change predictions say that that is unfortunately the, the start of what is going to happen into the future. So preparation and designing and building for enhanced bushfire safety isn't, should not just be an option. Certainly there are regulations, we'll talk about them a bit later in this discussion, but number one is the understanding that we can and must do better in terms of our, our building and uh, construction activity in huge parts of Australia, because the estimates that came out of the Royal Commission a year and a quarter, year and a half ago, was up to 10% of Australian houses suffer a bushfire uh, risk then you get into the subtleties of which state, how much, doesn't matter. We have up to 10% of our existing housing stock are at risk. So retrofitting is a fundamental need. So obviously Paul has some expertise there and we'll run through it. And John can talk more about building new and understanding what some of the restrictions could be or should be, or just sensible matters to reduce our household risks. Timber framing is obviously one of the most common things, lightweight, particularly on a sloping block. Uh, you used corrugated uh, colour bond, obviously well insulated. Would you like to talk more about that and the fire performance as you understand it? Well, bearing in mind, this is a, a long time ago when we designed this, Nigel, and uh, I'm not sure that, uh, well, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't uh, build the house in exactly the same way now. Um, but I think what, what, at the heart of all this, if you've got an existing home, so rather than me talking about in building a new home, because I haven't done that for a very long time, but in terms of an existing home, my advice to people is to, to be a detective, to absolutely, absolutely forensically examine your house in respect of everything that could possibly uh, be a vulnerability to bushfire or embers. And in terms of uh, steel cladding, be it colour bond or anything else, uh, it's, it's really good in that it's not flammable, but where you join it at corners, for example, the detailing there is quite important because if you've got a, uh, any gap in the envelope of your house that's more than two millimetres in width, then potentially an ember can get through. So when I say forensically examine your house, I mean go and look at every join between particular materials, uh, look at any um, entry points that embers can, can come in. John, interestingly, I, I might say, uh, mentioned that under my understanding from what he said was that underneath the steel sheet roof, uh, where, the, where the roof actually joins the vertical wall, I understood it that they, he had a profiled um, steel sheet there that, that meant there wasn't uh, a place for embers to get in. Now in my house, and I'm, uh, I'm sitting in my house right now, uh, one of the things when I forensically examined the house about three weeks before the bushfire hit, I suddenly realized that underneath the uh, color bond roof was this expanded foam uh, profile that is often used and uh, to stop um, insects and vermin getting in under the, under the roof. And I thought, crikey, what if that's, inflammable. So I got a piece out, put a, a match to it, and it virtually exploded into flame. So I said to myself, well, this is a key vulnerability. Have I got time to go around the entire circumference of the house, pull out this inflammable foam and fix it somehow? And I decided I had to. So over the I just did it for a couple of hours each day for about five days. And I pulled out the foam and stuffed glass fiber insulation in there. Now, that's just one anecdote. And, and so what, I'm, what my point is really that with existing homes, they've all got their own idiosyncrasies and design details. And 
if you are a bushfire resilient homeowner, you are going to need to go through and look at every possible vulnerability and prioritize it. Work out a work plan. So for me, I've got a to-do list on the house. Some things will take me two years to do still. Um, other things I can do tomorrow. But work out a, a work plan of how you're going to upgrade the bushfire resilience of your home over time. And that to me is a, a key to increasing the resilience of our built environment. Yes, thank you, Paul, well said. I, I just point out that the Sanctuary magazine uh, issue 53, which came out, when was it? Um, early this year, summer 2021. It has an article which I wrote called Beating Bushfire. And the whole point was it was priorities in how to address retrofitting. And that included exactly what Paul said in that it had photographs of my own house where the foam that you buy commonly, if it's Lysarts, it's now a BAL40 rated polyethylene. If you buy other brands, who knows? It could be anything. But the other thing is, sorry, that's that one. Otherwise, I did exactly what Paul said. I actually cut the profile because this was available 20 years ago off the shelf, but isn't currently. I've gone to a few manufacturers saying we need to have it back, but haven't got anywhere yet. So you still need in-roof ventilation, but the key point in the regulations that Paul alluded to is no gaps or cracks more than two millimeters. And the point of that is proven. 80 to 90% of houses lost in bushfire, it comes from burning embers and they can travel kilometers away from the fire front. So the questions that came up about, uh, let's see, about bowel rating, bushfire attack level, the regulations are broad brush that these days it relates to your bushfire attack level or bowel. And it's something that's not necessarily easy for people at home to work out. There is advice often you can get online, line, depending which state or territory you're in. Otherwise you can get a paid consultant who will obviously give you a more a deeper analysis and let you know. But certainly when it comes to applying for government or private certifiers to do additions or alterations or build new, the starting point is you must know your bowel rating. And then Australian Standard 3959, this document is the highly complex document that designers, builders and the like have to build to. So if you bowel up to bowel 29, it's doesn't require too much, which is exceptional or different or expensive. But if you're in an area, typically top of a hill, close to bushland, where the intensity of the fire will grow and the it will crown, that's when you have a high bushfire risk. At Bal 40 or flame zone, your costs will shoot up to get permission to build or even to retrofit. So always keep that in mind. If you're in a higher extreme bushfire area, get advice early and see what you can do. If you are a homeowner, just trying to do the everyday things to make it safer, have a look at that Sanctuary magazine. It runs through the advice. There's also online in Victoria. They've got quite a good online one from Country Fire Service. And CSIRO has recently just produced an online document freely available, again, to help people with everyday questions about bushfire. So, John Brennan, are you sorry, back online? John, are you back? No, <laughs> unfortunately, it appears not quite. So let's, let's ask some or respond to some of the questions. There is no one book at the moment I've been supposedly working on one for the last couple of years, but unfortunately I get too busy with everyday work and that's been too low on the priorities. But there is good advice on particularly New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland to a lesser degree South Australia and Tasmania, where there is short, sharp, free advice from the bushfire authorities in those states. 
So do have a look at that because that will really help you with a lot of the everyday questions. So um, let's see, more questions coming up online. The question here, Paul, can we give a link to your home? Not at the moment, I'm afraid, uh, Nigel. So um, yeah, that's work, work in progress. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay, again, there's, if you look at Sanctuary Magazine or go to Green Renew, there are, again, good examples online of houses that have survived. I mean, oh, this particular one, Sanctuary 55, has a review of one of my projects of a decade ago, which twice had a bushfire coming up the slope at it. It was a bit like John or Paul's. It was built on top of a slope. It was already a north-south slab, which was not ideal orientation. So it ended up having a roof which stepped, but we kept the profile low because one of the fundamentals is not, if you're on, on a slope, dig in, keep a low profile, don't build on top where the intensity will maximize. So here, we built low, we built a serrated roof so we could be sustainable in getting the sun coming into the rooms in the middle of the day. And on the west, where the view was, we put a stainless steel screen, two millimeter, which these days is the regulatory, regulatory requirement. Gaps and cracks, no more than two millimeters. So there, we had the screen to reduce Western heat, but also against bushfire, several meters away from the glass. So the opportunity to dissipate heat and protect the toughened glass, which now is mandated on any and all bushfire risk areas. So John, you're back with us. Thank yes, you. yes, I don't know, some technical problem or other. What were you wanting to ask? So um, you, you obviously worked hard. You had detachable steel shutters and you made the point they can be a bit heavy. Hmm. What further advice would you say in that the regulations say now bushfire shutters must much, much be attached. Yep. And they also say gaps and cracks no more than two millimetres. Yep. So okay. you built before that particular regulation, but what's your further comment about okay. it? So what we've started doing one by one is replacing those shutters. Um, where, and what we're doing, as I said, using an expa a, a proprietary expanded metal where the openings are, are well, I would say probably about 1.5. Um, and uh, that allows some dapple, reasonably attractive dappled light in, and they're permanently there in some cases. Where that wasn't appropriate because of the view, or we wanted more sunlight or something, um, we're uh, allowing them to, to rotate back like a door um, so that they're permanently attached, but you can just swing them back in and there's a strong latch to latch them on. And I think that's the best we could do. If I was building the house from scratch, I'd probably come up with something a bit better, but, but we've got to work with what we've got, as Paul had to. Um, mm. but, but certainly I really strongly endorse um, taking some measure to protect all your glazing. Yes. Glazing mm. is commonly regarded as the next most vulnerable area after gaps and cracks and uh, the possibility of holding your roof down because as Paul said you've got extreme winds often associated or even caused by a bushfire. Yeah so, I should say about that that when our builder was doing it um, after discussion with us he actually built to Darwin standards to hold the whole joint together. <laughs> it's, it's sort of built down to the concrete slab so I don't think it's going anywhere fast. One of the difficulties, of course, in practical terms, is that we're not only building our houses for fire, we're building them to live in. Mm. And there are, there are characteristics of our block, wherever it is, that we really want to make use of. So there's, there's always a degree of compromise, um, which, is, which is sometimes very difficult to reach. But, but there's no use building a place that you hate living in. Yes, exactly. And that's the point about you want to be open to the atmosphere, the, the climate, your garden, your view, your outlook. So compromise is always required. But as Paul said early, the forensic examination, if you're in a higher extreme bushfire area, that one day can undo 
you know, a lifetime of work and worry. So mm. you do need to be very cautious. Absolutely. So, and we were fortunate in our builder in that regard, he, because he lives in the area, he's been through fire himself. He was meticulous in the way that Paul described. Um, mm. And I'm very grateful to him for that. Um, the other thing, if you want to talk about, do you want to talk about um, uh, other measures for, for thermal control in the house? Please do. Yeah, we took, we went well over spec for insulation. And I suspect Paul may have done the same now that I've heard his background. Um, so the uh, it's all in the uh, profile on the Renew webpage, and I'm not going to remember all the figures, but we, we put in the absolute maximum we could in the Western wall and the Eastern wall. Um, the North has got a big pergola overhang. Uh, and when I say pergola, it's almost a veranda. Again, it's this expanded metal stuff. Uh, and in fact, it's got a... Um, um, so the, the no direct light gets onto the north at all. Um, and on the western side, no direct light gets on until about five o'clock in the afternoon, because again, there's a, a pergola out reaching out on the western side. In the, we obviously had the standard insulation underneath the, the, the roof itself. And then in the cavity, um, well, it's not a real, you know, call it a cavity. Um, Again, I think it's um, R6. Would that be possible, Nigel, R6 in the room? Yes. Anyway, um, and we found that the house is, is just very, very, very stable. We use almost no heating and uh, would be very rare that we have got a reverse cycle um, unit, which we swore we would never put in, but we, we capitulated after one very bad run of days in the summer a couple of years ago hardly ever turn it on, maybe maybe four days a year. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the question there, or the matter arising, is Western glazing, extensive Western glazing, is too often a problem in so much of Australian land mass because the low afternoon sun is just too hot. So mm -hmm. you can't just extend the eve to the east or the west when the sun is so low in the sky. That's the point then of looking at vertical that, that you can twist using nature, making sure perhaps you've got the trees, hopefully not super flammable ones too close, but using deciduous trees, early morning sun, western afternoon sun, in high summer, you want the shade. So there are ways you do that east and west compared to what you do to the north. So, that's important. So, um, Paul, uh, a few more questions have naturally come up about sprinkler systems, their cost and their effectiveness. What would you have to say, having been through that exercise? Well, I have, I have to say, Nigel, that uh, when I in, uh, installed the sprinkler systems on the house 24 years ago, and they're still basically the same as I, I, I had 24 years ago, um, I was doing a lot of this by common engineering, common sense, I guess, and um, a bit of a background in physics and so on. And we installed um, impact sprays, so the sort of sprays that go ch -ch -ch -ch, you see around um, for irrigating uh, gardens and um, pastures and so on. So it was pretty basic. Since that time, one of my uh, colleagues, Dr. Alan Green, has completed his PhD and done a lot of research on bushfire sprinkler systems. And, and I'd say that, well, and, and in addition, we have an Australian standard, AS5414, uh, entitled Bushfire Water Spray Systems. So things have come on a lot since uh, 1997, but there is still yet uh, uh, some major gaps in, first of all, our understanding of exactly how water sprays behave during bushfire. So we've spoken about uh, wind and how that can uh, even damage buildings. Well, obviously, if you've got a water spray system around your house and you've got an intense wind, that is going to blow the water droplets hither and thither. And so our research, um, Alan Green and myself, was about uh, looking at, at those sorts of things. 
then there's a question you mentioned, um, I think, uh, the economics of these sorts of things. So AS5414, for example, the Australian standard, will lead you to build an absolutely bomb-proof uh, sprinkler system, but it's going to cost a lot of money, in my view. And not everybody um, has that sort of money to spend. And a lot of people we found in our research, just looking at how people have responded to bushfires, have gone out and bought bush fire, um, spring, bought sprinklers and pumps and water uh, pipe work and so on, and use these to actually great effect. And in, in our case, in our house, uh, I, I would say our sprinklers played a major part in why our house survived. So I, I'm a strong believer in bushfire sprinkler systems. They don't, they're not a substitute for all the other good things that we've mentioned already in terms of passive bushfire resistant design. So having non-flammable materials, having an ember proof house and so on, but they are a very important active measure that can be taken. And I notice uh, there's one question in the question and answer section there asking, how did I manage the sprinklers during um, the impact of the bushfire, and that's a that's a, a really important question. And the answer was that I actually rehearsed how my sprinklers were working. So I made some calculations as to how much water the sprinklers were going to put out once I'd swi uh, switched them on to the header tank up the hill. But I also measured. Uh, how fast the water level dropped in our tank up the hill. So I, I would like to, to have a, a phrase, research and rehearse become part of our lexicon when it comes to bushfire resilience. So you, we, it doesn't matter whether you're testing your sprinkler system or figuring out how you're gonna pack all your valuables in your car because you're going to evacuate you need to role play these activities because when you're under pressure, um, either in the days before a bushfire arrives or actually when a bushfire is happening, things go wrong. And unless you role play, you won't see where the holes in your plan are. Very good advice. Thank you, Paul. I'm a man who knows the engineering and knows from practical experience what you have to do. Um, can I ask John? Paul to comment on decisions that we had to make um, just because we were ahead of the game, so to speak, as you were, um, or ahead of the considerations? Um, the thing seemed to be to have from your circular main um, stand-ups, standard stand-ups, and to run your sprinklers, particularly in our case on the north and the south, which are the two areas that fire can really come at us from, uh, in the if you like, parallel to the walls, so that the wind blew the water onto the house, whereas people who had them on the roof find that it just like <laughs> blows down downstream and no, no use to man or beast. Uh, can you comment, Paul? Well, you, you've uh, raised a very interesting and um, important issue, John, and it's complicated how wind and buildings interact and when you put water droplets from bushfire sprinklers or sprays, it gets more complex. So there's no 100% straight answers here. The, the, the key thing we're looking to do is get the water, your precious water out of no doubt a very limited um, storage, get that pressure, precious water on the surfaces that you want to protect. So Walls, if you've got flammable, other flammable materials around the house, lots of houses have wooden veranda posts or timber decks, uh, you need to get water there. So where you place your sprinklers is incredibly important. And then secondly, working out, well, how long will my water last? And these are all not easy questions to answer. But we are making progress at the moment. Uh, 
myself and Alan Green from the Sustainable Buildings uh, Research Center are working with some other key stakeholders in, in this space around sprinklers. And we're hopeful that we'll be getting some funding forthcoming in the relatively near future so we can put together a much more user-friendly set of advice for householders on how to set up sprinkler systems. Mm. Thank you, Paul. I mean, that's very important because for so many existing houses, there is a limit to how much you can change the fabric at, on a budget. Mm -hmm. So one of the fundamental things that I put forward to the Royal Commission was we need to further the research and understanding of sprinkler systems. And Alan Green and Paul are, are the leaders in that regard because the Australian Standard 2014 AS5414 is not a useful standard. It's recognized as being hardly used because it's a Rolls Royce, it's got the sprinklers on top of the roof, a whole series of things which practice has shown is not the way to go. Even the simplest little home sprinkler um, has made a difference anecdotally on a number of projects. So that really is an upgrade has been agreed in principle to the Australian standard. It's the research between the Sustainability Research Center and others, that's what we need to get the evidence to promote it. But just an answer to Phil, and no doubt a regular question is, what, what sets it off? How long does it last? What is the, the motor? So to explain, obviously before the fire hits the building, you might have hours or even a day or more of burning embers coming your way. The actual fire front that John alluded to can come and go sometimes, or actually Paul did, in a matter of minutes, the intensity, the flame, the whatever, and then things are burning for hours or sometimes days or even weeks. So to control your sprinkler system efficiently, you need to look at how much water, what kind of spray system, what, how long for. Just to give you some idea, one of my projects under construction, Flame Zone, January last year, client said, I want to add a water spray system. We'd done all the physical things. He wanted greater safety. Problem was we had a 20,000 litre buried concrete water tank and the calculations showed it would go through 14,000 litres in the half an hour of wetting in advance, 20 minutes of intense spray deluge and then the rest of the hour again intermittent light spray so 14,000 of 20 would go in an hour and yes recycling the water off the roof then became important but the point to be made is you do need advice you need it's it's a matter of plumbing hydronic flow um, the the source needs to be a diesel it needs to get airflow it needs to be protected and it needs regular maintenance because I know of stories where people that had that system, but they couldn't start it at the, the moment they critically needed it. So all of these things come into play. So it's not, it's not a game that anyone can play. You do need proper expertise, proper measuring, sufficient water and a system which can be operated at the crucial time because as Paul said, research and rehearse, critical if for perhaps water spray systems more than any other. But John, yeah, please. Yeah, um, absolutely, Nigel, about expert advice. Um, in Victoria, at least, um, and it certainly applies to us, we're required by the CFA as a condition of our planning permit to have a dedicated storage, which will last for an hour. An hour's not much, but um, in fact, we've got the capacity to do far more than that, but that's a minimum requirement. Um, the second thing is, yes, absolutely about your rehearsals in our fire plan, um, and everyone should have a fire plan, and it should be reviewed annually, and I'm sure the CFA or its equivalents interstate will have said that to people. Um, we we uh, have dress rehearsals of lighting, the, lighting starting, <laughs> uh, both the generator and the fire pump, and I insist on the wife doing it with me, as it were, absent. Uh, and there, of course, there are instructions for strangers actually in, in the uh, switchboard for the generator and in the um, pump house, which is protected in the way Nigel described. 
so that a stranger ought to be able to do it as well. Because it's just amazing. You think diesels will always go, but they don't. And so we, you have to rehearse it. Sure, thank you. Phil has raised the uh, fundamental issue too about the nature of your landscape and the plantings and the proximity. Mm -hmm. Because Victoria has led the way, Country Fire Authority, in terms of the one and only Australian publication, which very effectively talks about the um, ecology, gives five, sorry, four examples across different ecotones, different areas of Victoria, how you can use your landscape and your planting plant wise to reduce the fire risk. Every, every state, every region, bioregion should have the equivalent, unfortunately not yet produced. Because as I'm sure we all know, plants will burn, but some are far more inhibiting, might reduce the heat, reduce the, the embers. And in fact, I, when I spent most of 2009 following the Victorian fire, I have photographs of showing the grass fire that went right up to the, the row of windbreak cypress. Half is burnt to nothing, and the other half remained green and protected the heritage timber house directly behind. Mm -hmm. There are many anecdotal stories like this, and that's the point. We back to research and rehearse and be careful, be cautious, but do be aware because we have to finish up in the next minute or two, that there is a lot of good free advice on the websites of Country Fire Authority, Rural Fire Authority, Queensland Fire and Rescue, South Australia, etc. Last words from Paul before I pass it on to last words from John. Thank you, Nigel. I think it's been uh, very helpful. I in terms of uh, resources, I would just like to support what you said about the CSIRO's new bushfire best practice guide. I think that's uh, filled a, a big gap in um, accessible knowledge for householders and homeowners about how to, all, all things to do with bushfire. So I, I'd recommend people go and check that out. Online. And the only addition I'd make would be, uh, even if you're still not living there in a building, join your local fire guard group. Uh, with the CFA, we meet always before the bushfire season and usually two or three times during the course of the year. You meet your neighbours, you hear stories, you get good advice. The CFA will come up and have a look at the place. Uh, very useful resource, as well as the printed ones. Yes. Okay, look, thank you very much, John. Paul, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've shared with us and your insights and your advice is extremely useful. And I'm sure to the listeners online, obviously we've got lots of questions. I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer every single one directly, but as was pointed out on the Q&A, you can follow up um, and see the discussion again or share it with family or friends because research and rehearse. Thank you for that, Paul Cooper. And thank you, everybody. It's been a good session. All the very best to you. Ready for next time. Bye. Thank you so much, Nigel. And thank you so much to Paul and John as our panellists in that session. That was such a great way to wrap up Sustainable House Day 2021. Um, hearing your experiences of bushfires is a real reminder of why what we're doing today is so important. And I have to say that hearing birdsong in the background, as you say it, is something that leaves me with, uh, with a bit of optimism at the end of this day as well. So thank you for that too. Um, I would like to extend a really huge thank you to all of our homeowners, experts and MCs throughout the day. It's been a really, really wonderful day um, for so many of us. Um, Sustainable House Day couldn't happen without the, without the participation of our homeowners. It couldn't happen without the support of our sponsors and our council partners. So to all of you, thank you so much. Um, we've all seen those sponsors, the, the names of those organisations and councils throughout, throughout the course of the day and stuff. We'd like to briefly remind you that all of today's sessions were recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. To be notified of when they're up, you can subscribe to our channel at youtube.com slash Renew Australia. There are still a few Sustainable House Day events coming up and you can still view our 130 homes that are open online for you to view. You can see all of those homes and our additional events at sustainablehouseday.com. Once again, to everyone who has taken part in today, um, presenting and participating, thank you so much again for your participation. Have a fantastic evening.